Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our great uh, panel session. Uh, my name is George Fomichev, and today we are going to speak about Industry 4.0 from Initiative to Imperative. So. What's actually going to be in the next uh, few years, um, especially now when we have these uh, COVID uh, things that are still disturbing. I mean, uh, if you look at stock markets, you would probably see that markets are quite optimistic and they believe that everything is behind. But the reality is probably different. I've heard that a few countries already had uh, some extra lockdowns and that that might, might not uh, end up very quickly. Also, um, I noticed that for a few months we, we have some inflation expectations that could, can actually um, have negative impact on future recovery because now it's not really clear what um, governments and central banks should do. And uh, we, we still, I, I'm just talking about uh, also business in Russia that we still see some uh, unemployment and we see some problems with uh, new job openings and also the same uh, what I've heard uh, we have in America. So uh, yeah, let's just uh, start our session uh, with a like one, two minute intro of uh, personal background, personal experience, and then you can tell me what you have in mind and what you wanna share with our public. Um, so who wants to go first? Ladies first? Ladies first. Okay, then uh, Michelle? <laughs> Not ladies like? first. <laughs> okay. Michelle, would you like? Sure, sure. Um, I'm uh, Michele Mosca. I work in cryptography and quantum computing. Uh, so there's a happy side to quantum computing. I started another company. I don't run it, but that works on uh, helping organizations understand how quantum computing will impact their company, their sector, so they can prepare for it. Um, and Evolution Q, which I lead, is really focused on making sure Getting an because right now all of our enterprises are vulnerable to quantum enabled attacks. So quantum can do a lot of great things, but it can also decimate essentially all of our digital platforms, which is bad. So there is no happy quantum unless we first make sure our digital platforms don't get broken by them in a very systemic, sustained way. So that's what Evolution Q is all about. We want organizations through lifecycle management, proactively through lifecycle management, migrate to a more resilient quantum. thought that, you know, sustainability is important, which absolutely it is. But even broader than sustainability, uh, we need to like, bake in resilience from the beginning. Because if you, you build up this great edifice of capability and wealth generation and so on, but it's just susceptible to the slightest, you know, winds, uh, it's not going to last very long. Uh, especially, again, because of this massive concentration uh, of wealth generation on a small number of platforms, um, the risks are actually much more correlated and systemic. So we do need to have to also increase up our game uh, with regards to resilience. I just last want to distinguish between resilience and my focus is cyber resilience, but there's other forms of resilience too versus security. Like so resilient, you don't get resilience by committing to take a vaccine when it's available. Like it's a much more uh, sophisticated, proactive uh, program and mindset that's needed. So security is an easy sell because, of course, I want to be secure against the imminent threats. But the discipline to really bake in resilience against future known and unknown threats, that's where humanity does not have a great track record for that. And I think we do need to proactively acknowledge our, our bad instincts, or I should say bad, they're our instincts, um, and, and subvert them and create not just better, you know, more productive systems and so on and so on, but more resilient uh, systems and societies. 
Okay, yeah, uh, we spoke before and we had an interesting conversation about um, the safetyness, right, of, of current systems and crypt- cryptography. So uh, just tell our audience how good quantum computers will be, or maybe they already are, uh, like br- in breaking uh, our current um you know, infrastructure. So you told me before that uh, even encrypted data could be recorded now or stored somewhere. And so once uh, quantum computers can hack it, that will be open for public. So is that true or we shouldn't be much worried about it? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm happy to elaborate, you know, up front on this. Um, indeed, it's something that we, we need to have been thinking about yesterday. Um, so just to quickly summarize, quantum computers, a new kind of computer that takes advantage of physics that was discovered 100 years ago. And we're at the cusp. Like, for example, IBM says it will demonstrate a fault-tolerant logical quantum bit, whatever that is, in 2023. You know, if we don't, if we're, ni- if we're not 75 to 90% ready to defend against, so one or two fault-tolerant qubits or 10 is not at risk. But a few thousand will, will do what? First of all, you know, this, if let's say we were doing a secure uh, web, you know, uh, phone call or Zoom call or whatever, or we're communicating security through a VPN, transmitting national security secrets, trade secrets, anything really that needs to be secure for more than 10 years, if it's being recorded, it can be decrypted. And and when we have, again, about 4,000 of these logical quantum bits, it can be decrypted. And how... Uh, cyber threat actors will exploit that. Uh, there's countless ways uh, they can. Uh, and, and from experience, anything we think of today, it'll probably be very different and in many ways worse. So information being recorded today, and it, with, with work from home, because of COVID, there's even more traffic. We're taking much greater risks, right? Before there's conversations we would have only had in person. Now we have no choice, so we're doing them online. We got this, you know, 128-bit security, but it's not. It's only secure against today's attacks, not the ones we know are coming. So, we ha- and it's a 10- to 20-year roadmap to migrate digital. This is not a weekend patch, right? This is not a Tuesday update. It's a 10- to 20-year program to go into the guts of all of our digital systems. And my- it's, a- it's a hell of a lot more complicated than Y2K ever was. And there's a lot more at stake, of course, in 2020 and 2030 than there was in 1999. So it's a massive migration. You need to start early. And if you don't do it, today's secrets are vulnerable. But the other risks are there's two or three other massive, again, systemic threats to all of our digital platforms and therefore our entire economy. And one is if you try to rush, if you don't do this proactive, you don't take advantage of this blessing that we've known about this threat since 1994 and have time to do it, proactively, if you try to rush the deployment of a fundamental platform, you are for sure going to make many, many mistakes. You're going to lose business. You're going to lose interoperability. You're going to get all sorts of, you know, economic repercussions simply because you rushed a very fundamental building block. It won't work properly for one. Secondly, there'll be security vulnerabilities for sure. There'll be many, many more so-called zero day attacks when, you know, As a, when I put on my attacker hat, I love it when the people I want to attack deploy their security measures in a rush, right? I, I love that as an attacker. So when I go back to being the defender, it's like, okay, let's not rush. Let's take a responsible life cycle management. Secondly, if, if the systems aren't, you know, quantum, made quantum resilient in time, then we're really talking about digital platforms collapsing. It's not just about secrets getting leaked. You know, we're moving to a world with more and more IoT, driverless cars, connected medical devices that are, you know, we're talking about things and, and, and you know, um, operational, this OT is going to impact OT. It's really a, a much a bigger threat than it was 10, 20 years ago, and it will be even more in 10 years to come. Uh, you know, you talk about cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm not so worried about mining, you know, Bitcoin or so on, but the current wallets are all susceptible, right? So yeah, I, I mean, they, they, they become susceptible. I mean, anyone can can take them and I mean, decrypt with a, yeah. you know, your public key and it's gone. <laughs> and, and so lastly, you know, uh, in theory, we know how to build quantum safe wallets, but you have to actually do it. 
And the other thing, and I've talked to people in, you know, other sectors, they're worried that even just lack of confidence in the institutions can lead to a collapse, right? If people stop trusting banks, uh, you know, you don't even need to hack them. You've already decimated uh, the financial system. And you can apply that across the board to other sectors as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting point of view. So, uh, Elidio, who would you like to take uh, take the lead now? Okay. You hear me. Um, I'm a Portuguese. I'm a civil engineer, educated in America and in Switzerland and Portugal. Uh, and I have a, a group of uh, consulting consultancy uh, engineering. Uh, mostly in Asia, we worked in Africa and Brazil and America and Middle East as well, but now we're more Portugal and the Far East. So um, this 4.0 and soon 5.0, I'm sure, uh, calls for a lot of uh, changes in uh, in uh, our projects of engineering in the infrastructures or industry or something like this, because now we have to uh, replace uh, millions of people, or at least in the factory, thousands of people to robots and uh, uh, and we are thinking about lo a lot we are, uh, some people are already working on it uh, on 3d printing for construction in fact uh, we, we discussed today how we could uh, make a building in uh, mars you know it's very easy because the material is there is just to send some more things and they can build up and uh, and our friend from tesla he'd be very happy to have a city there just a matter of uh, oxygen and so on, but I'm sure you can you can uh, do something. But the artificial intelligence is on and on. But the the in the future we'll have much more than than that, and that's where uh, a lot of uh, engineering that we do uh, today is not um, adaptable so easily to new ideas, new uh, new. Um, uh, new high speed of IIoT and all these. It's good to have, but it's not adapted. And a lot of things, okay, uh, transportation, you can put some switching and, uh, and do as a lot of uh, trains are already, uh, you know, remotely controlled. But there is a lot of things in, in uh, industry, especially the heavy industry, which needs to be rethought completely from refineries and so on especially because also we are moving from carbon uh, related industries to to uh, uh, you know totally different you know from uh, uh, renewable energies you know from wind uh, sun so solar water hydrogen and so on so this changes not only what we know uh, for the time being in terms of uh, uh, 4d or whatever it is but the whole uh, uh, difference is what we're going to do in the very close future. Maybe in 10 years, we are going to be totally different. And this calls for a lot of other controls. Involved in security for uh, for example, trains and metros, which is very important and can be controlled from uh, from outside, but also decontrolled from outside. And this is the, the other problem. So security, uh, besides safety, is a very uh, it, it can happen not only in the network, in the internet, and all this, but also in equipment. Planes can be deviated from their that even uh, satellites can be changed in some films, you can see this, but it's possible. So this is what I think the four uh, industry point, point, four point zero and soon 5.0 has to address different forms of security uh, using, of course, what we know so far, but the evolution is very quick. It's, uh, uh, it's quicker than what we thought. And of course, security, like uh, you're talking about the, the currencies, you know, the uh, bitcoins and so on. That's a big mystery for me, but that's another thing. I don't want to get involved in that because security of that, you know, you can influence, you can get into it. You know, any smart guy in, in Russia or um, Israel can probably do it very easily or in China maybe. So that's what I think the, you know, when we talk about 
Industry 4.0, yes, it is a way, but we need to think about security control uh, with the good guys, because the bad guys are always there. You know, whatever, you know, all this uh, internet uh, uh, fake uh, things and so on, it's, uh, I think it's very concerning. And we are very concerned when we do design some, some projects of an airport or, or shipyard or something. We understand that, but we don't, uh, we, we don't put there, you know, the energy enough to secure that in the future. I think that's it. Yeah, very good point. I really like your uh, idea about uh, 3D printing houses, etc. Yeah, we, we do uh, we do lasers and uh, for laser production, we do a lot of 3D printing because it's much easier for modeling. And also we even make plastic, um, uh, pl plastic laser boxes uh, 3D printed because it's simply cheaper. And once we have different components, it's very easy to change the model and make and other modifications. So yeah, indeed that's uh, changed an entire sector and it's not that expensive and it's much easier than to do metal work. And probably, yes, you are right that in future, um, 3D house buildings would be, well, it looks like it could be done uh, easily and uh, would have some some perspective. Um, so um, who would like to, to be next? Viren, what do you think? Sure, thank you. Taking from what my colleagues talked about, exotic about crypto and going into space, I'll take you back down into the shop floor. So my background, I, I work with one of the world's largest companies in machine castings. So we have several factories across Asia and in North America and 7,000 people. And over the last several years, we've been trying to connect these plants and the machines and the people through digitalization. So that's one part of my, that's my background. The company is Sigma Electric. And from my point of view, I'm trying to share with you what I see as because we deal with companies all across the world, customers and vendors. I, I, we look upon ourselves, though we're manufacturers, I really think about ourselves as a global supply chain leader. And when I look across the world and what just happened recently with COVID and the disruption in supply chain, which brought a lot of concern to every global manufacturer, and it was a deep concern with them. So with that, they have started looking at alternate sourcing of material, near shoring, onshoring in next to their plants. So there's a whole realignment of supply chain. And leading to that is the economic situation of trying to ensure that a company and countries remain productive, remain efficient. So when you combine all of this, and that's going to re lead to or lose out on economic development. So when you put all this together, and when you see what's needed today, I just believe from our own experience that Industry 4.0, the whole aspect of digitalization, lean manufacturing, reskilling, are the areas that are going to make a difference in terms of bringing productivity, efficiency to the company. And when you lead that on and across the country, you do that, that's going to make a difference. And I think that's going to make a difference to the whole world if we are able to do it. My concern is, while the topic today, I very rightly so, is the imperative need for Industry 4.0, but at least from my experience of visiting hundreds of factories and companies across the world, Industry 4.0 and digitalization is talked about, is implemented in bits and pieces, but is not prevalent, is not there as a structured approach across companies, across countries, across the world. So we're missing out on efficient manufacturing. And that's the concern that we all should take forward. And just to share with you a couple of very quick points, some of you might know that the World Economic Forum uh, has conducted a, what, a, what they call a global lighthouse program. They had about 54 sites. They added 15 very recently. So they have 69 sites. And these are some of the world's leading companies, Unilever, Bosch, Schneider, Tara Steel, and others. And it's an exper interesting experiment of sorts where individual plants have gone ahead and digitalized, gone into deeply into Industry 4.0. And, and the results from that are amazing. 
the improvement in productivity, in in product in profitability, in in managing in people related matters is so enormous. The numbers are amazing, and I think that's and, and that's what well, that's what we've experienced in our own plants in a in a small way. And the companies that I've looked at where digitalization has been done, there's been a lot of improvement. So I think we've got the basis for effective future efficient manufacturing, combine that with IoT, combine that with uh, additive manufacturing, uh, augmented reality, and all the other things that we all realize and package that in. I think that's the need of the day. And for the submission I have for all of you today is how do we all work together to make this happen? I'm talking to people in the US. I've been talking to the government in India also, talking to various industry companies, to various large companies say, what can we all do together to make this happen? And that's really what I'd like to leave with all of you and the audience that there is a need for us all to partner, work together to make it happen. I mean, I also to share with you, just recently, it happened about three weeks ago, uh, Alibaba announced that after three years, they, they, had a, they announced and brought, uh, brought public, and there's a small video also of them, uh, uh, an experiment which they carried out over three years, and it's, they've set up the most advanced manufacturing plant, highly digitalized in the world, makes apparel, clothing, and the name of the company is Shunshi Digital. And it, their plan for Alibaba is to roll this across China. So if you look at it and you look at each of our countries, each of our companies and say, my God, this is a, a, an amazing ambition. Can we also, as com companies, as, as countries, can we look at how do we roll out digitalization, industry 4.0? And as my colleague said, we're soon going to go to industry 5.0. I mean, the whole effective machine and man interfacing is going to go to another level altogether. So we need to be prepared for that. And that's our future. If we don't do it, companies will not succeed and flourish. Countries will not succeed and flourish. So it's so imperative that we need this on, on a real bit quick basis and as they call it it's an accelerated movement required really accelerated to make this happen very quickly so that's the submission i have from my side in terms of how to take it forward based on my own experience in our own digitalization efforts and what i've seen across the world i think it's one of the most amazing and most exciting things for the for right now happening but needed much more in the future Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's very interesting. I just have a few notes that I want to share with you. So first of all, it's very important to understand the, the price for this digitalization because, I mean, in terms of cryptocurrency, what, what, what I was uh, saying before with Michelle, uh, that it consumes, Bitcoin consumes amount of like two, uh, 20, maybe 30 million tons of oil uh, so producing, uh, well, literally nothing, or it, it's my point of view. And also there's a question, how much energy do we spend on this uh, digital economy? So we need also to be careful with that. Uh, another thing <laughs> that um, I'm also concerned about, uh, you said about supply chain, that uh, due to COVID, it's, it's changed completely. And I noticed it from my business that, uh, what was easy to buy, uh, let's say, one year ago, uh, now this supply chain changed and now we have to find some substitutes. Probably you, you face it the same thing. And the final thing about uh, supply chain uh, is that prices changed dramatically. I mean, we, like, like I said before in my opening, that uh, central banks, they do not see inflation, but uh, once we get different components, we uh, some components increased like five, ten times during last uh, last year, and that's that's something concerning because I, I'm afraid that some companies, they were just gone, and that is risk that uh, we do not see right now. I'm afraid that uh, like there are a lot of companies, zombie companies that are on the market. We do not feel it now because we have very good stimulus. We have, but but what if uh, like ten or twenty percent companies they gone and the supply chain have to be redone? Uh, redone? Yeah, we, we need to find another way. So that was just my two cents. <laughs> 
Uh, I can just add, George, just one quick comment. Uh, yeah, sure. What you said is very right. And I just want to address one comment that you, are, you mentioned earlier, the cost of uh, capital and cost of energy. I'm going to address only the cost of capital part. And it, it's not true in every project, but a large number of digitalization projects, at least on the manufacturing side in the plants, my experience has been, and it's been proven through the Global Lighthouse project also, that most of these projects pay for themselves. Just imagine, you I'm just giving an example, any number, just say you spend half a million dollars, but you get a productivity improvement of 30% or 40%, and you get various cost, cost reduction improvements across the plant. These projects normally pay for themselves within a year, year and a half, roughly, and I'm, I'm just giving this an approximation. So that's the big, sometimes there's practically no capital involved because your, your, your payback is so efficient. So that's something to keep in mind. And it's always been the concern. All every industry thinks, oh my God, how can I put this cap, up, upfront commitment of cost or people into it? How, when will I get the return? But the, the returns can be so amazing if digitalization is implemented ambitiously, properly across a wide area. So again, just wanted to leave you with that comment. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe Gustavo, would you like to to continue? I'd be happy to also go after that because I think Viren and I have some very aligned um, thinking. I would love to jump in if that's okay. Just okay. <laughs> Gustavo, okay. do you mind? Is that okay? Okay, good. Um, so I'm Joe Riley. I am um, the CEO of Sensia. Sensia is in talent intelligence. So we really focus on the world of of people and understanding uh, what kind of skills they can do and how those can be applied into organizations. And I think Viren brought up some really, really important points. You know, what's, what is what attracts me to Industry 4.0 is that, you know, if you think about this, and Viren highlighted this, that while many companies focus on how do we digitize, how do we implement technology, the reality is that actually two thirds of those technology deployments fail because people are unable to actually do, use the technology. They're not ready to use the technology. They don't know how to deploy the technology. And therefore a lot of the work that is going into trying to digitize the world is actually failing because of the skills within the world of talent. And I think that what is attractive in this conversation or what I get excited about in this conversation is, you know, that automation and, and the investment of AI is will lead to massive job disruption. There, you know, we, today it's reported that there will be 85 million jobs that are lost, but it will also lead to massive opportunity financially for organizations and massive job creation. So while 85 million jobs are going to be lost, there are actually 97 million jobs that are going to be created. And so the the real problem that is going to occur is on these on these organizations and on these nations to try and figure out how do we upskill the workforce to be able to actually deploy these technologies, to be able to keep up to the pace of the technology development. You know, there's a, a great report that I read recently that Corn Ferry put out where that by 2030, we have such a skill shortage today that with the advancement of technology and digitization, industry 4.0, or soon to, soon to be 5.0, that it will result in $8.5 trillion revenue loss for organizations because they don't have enough skilled talent. If they do not upskill their talent, if they do not retrain them new skills, if they don't get them prepared for the future, the organizations are gonna lose $8.5 trillion in revenue. And we look at that, it's just such a massive number and it's such a huge problem for organizations that we do need to figure out how do we upskill the 54% of employees out there that are today not prepared for the future and are gonna lose their jobs. And how do we also fill this huge gap of talent that we're not graduating enough people? We, they're not leaving, you know, they don't come into the job market with the right skills. We have to teach them these new skills. And so is it on the corporations? Is it on governments? Is it on education? How are we going to kind of all work together to make this happen? And, you know, that's, that's, that's what excites me about this topic. So I wanted to jump in because Viren and I obviously have quite yeah, a lot of alignment on that point. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that that, that point, John. But also, there, there is a problem with with people when you try to re-educate them or offer another another job position. So, for example, here 
uh, in Russia, my um, we we do we, we are a US based company, but we have an operational part and assembling parties here in Russia, in small city, Smolensk. So when I try to find people uh, for laser assembling and laser testing, I invite them and say, okay, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you. So it's it's not so easy that people want to learn something and they say, okay, you would need to spend, let's say, at least a few months to learn doing something. And, you know, people, they're not very happy with that. So they say, okay, I just, I'm an accountant. I don't want to assemble lasers or I don't want to to to, to sell them. I don't, it's, it's a problem of how you prepare people for that. It's, it, that's the only way. I mean, they have to, to accept new rules. They have to accept that the world is changed and their position is no longer needed. Because, for, I, I mean, uh, like accountants, I mean, we had a lot of uh, problems and a lot of um, students, they got accountant degree, but now everything is automated and you don't need that, uh, that you know, accounting knowledge anymore. It's just useless. You need to, to be retrained. And but there's quite- like... Just to yeah. interrupt you on that, I mean, you're right. Accounting is such an incredibly strong, you know, area that is getting disrupted and there's, the numbers are very high and the people that have gone down the accounting journey. The reality though, is that accountants, for example, align very closely with big data specialists that can go in and do the analysis that is required in big data. And actually the skill set is very complementary. And this is what we, you know, we've contextualized data on 550 million people around the world. We have to cluster and analyze 2.4 billion skills around the world to understand how do all these go together to recognize patterns on what what jobs can this group of people do and whether it, if you're in marketing how can you align directly with an IT specialist if you are in you know accounting how do you align directly with big data analysts and again these are these are jobs that we don't have big data analysts are so critical and we don't have anywhere close to the numbers that that kind of you know, clear matching is going to be very critical for us to be successful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, 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 Gustavo. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so excited about this conversation. Uh, uh, 35 years in Procter and Gamble, uh, sometime in the Kimberly Clark and uh, startup work uh, in the area of Industry 4.0 uh, at a startup called uh, Smarter Chains, which is a, a platform to the, to develop a strategy a direction for manufacturers to go about this issue, this very issue we're talking. I think we have it, an, an amazing opportunity in front of us, we, and we just had the, me- the best demonstration of, of the business case for acceleration on technology adoption, which is a COVID-19 test, where we, we saw our, our supply chains and manufacturing units uh, uh, shaking whether or not they could deliver to, to, to their customers. And significant efforts were, were took, took place for us to comply with the ba- basics of delivering products out there. So it is really, really a test of that the fact that we haven't really leveraged the time and the opportunity of learning, incorporating, and strategically leveraging a technology and uh, specifically digital technology, I perform zero. But in general, automation will be in the same box. So, that, that, and, I, and, and I, it is amazing, but there is a recent study uh, run by Smarter Chains last year uh, where, where, where we did a, a benchmarking analysis of uh, you know, a bunch of, 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 of operations. I don't need to get into a statistic right now, but, uh, but the, the, the benchmarking study uh, uh, showed that only 10% of the sample that, that, that was analyzed, only 10% of the plants that were in, participating in this, in this study had, uh, were leveraging technology at scale. So 90% of the plants, and we were talking about a, a Fortune 500 type of company plants, and uh, these, these, uh, these, these companies or these plants are not leveraging technology enough. There are areas that are so worrisome. For example, the study says that the number one and number two uh, reasons why this is not happening at, at an accelerated way is leadership and organizational readiness, which we just talked. It's, it's exactly the problem that we are facing. 
it is an imperative that we leaders in the industry take on this and really, really stop piloting and testing. And, you know, I, I have no problem with, uh, with uh, lighthouses because it's had amazing demonstration cases. But, 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 but it's, um, it's time to move. We learn a lot. We learn enough. It's time to move on to strategically addressing the, the definition of roadmaps that make sense to our own industries and drive this as implementation faster. And, and this is, I think we, we should just take uh, that as leaders, move it on fast. I, however, need to report that this is uh, an improve uh, uh, from what I, what I remember uh, in the last, I've been, fi- I've been driving this message for the last maybe five years. And it's the first time that in a panel, everybody's in agreement with that. So it's so beautiful to, to feel. So it's like being, there is progress, no? We are, we are thinking about it. We're conscious about it. And we need, and we need to, to move to action. So, so we really demonstrate and accelerate. Let's not, let's not allow any other, um, unplanned situation like, uh, COVID-19, you know, find us with the pants down. I'm sorry for the, the, the graphic uh, expression, but this is exactly what happened to us. And it should not happen ever again. I'm ready to to partner with you, uh, uh, Byron, in the in, in the in the drive to really make this happen at a scale. And it has to happen at scale. It cannot happen on bits and pieces as it is done is done so far. It is very interesting, right? That COVID, you know, nineteen, where while really really impacted the economy in, in in terrible ways around the world, it impacted a lot of people physically, health-wise, mentally, everything. And there was so many terrible byproducts, but it, it did accelerate all of us to use, yeah. it, it digitized the world so much faster than mm-hmm. we, we. I think people have been trying for so long that the byproduct is that we actually all came up to speed that while, you know, it, it wasn't just America, it wasn't just Latin America, it wasn't just Europe, it actually happened around the world where, you know, I was on the phone yes, yesterday with, with, um, another another technology business and they they really focus on latin america and asia and they were saying you know we could never we had to do every single thing in person because people would not have they would not customers or clients or whatnot would never meet with the company not in person and they he said it's just the efficiency the success the speed at which they want to take on technology is so much faster and no one would think anymore, why would you come here to meet with me? It takes so long to try and do that and the lost productivity that I do think that this is also an opportunity for us to see that a lot of people on their own started to skill themselves better for the future during this time. So it's a, I don't know how many of you feel the same way, but I have this love-hate relationship with the pandemic and the byproduct yes. of it because I think we would still be talking about this to this same group of people in t- 10 years and that lot would change if we didn't have the pandemic um, as we did where it accelerated a lot of the thinking. Yes, I, I thought, I'm totally with you on that, 100%. So on that, because I think, you know, Gustavo said the gap sort of leadership, uh, but maybe at a higher level, the gap is sort of the short-termism trap. There was no quick rewards or like our short-term reward mechanisms don't seem to sufficiently reward things that pay off in three, five, let alone 10 years, which is a lot of my work. So how can we change that fundamentally? Because, uh, you know, if, if our political leaders get penalized, like yeah. which politician was going to be rewarded for having a better pandemic preparedness plan? <clears throat> which CEO was going to get rewarded for something that pays off after they're not the CEO anymore? So how do we, I, this is, you know, this has been a problem for humans for millennia, but I think we need to figure a better solution. I, I, I don't have a, 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 a like a global solution to it, but I have the particular solution for every operation. Yeah, and, sure. uh, and, and I think that the, the, the particular solution of every operation starts with a clean, a clean understanding of the opportunities that you have, which we understand today, because I mean, it's a, uh, uh, ever since the machinery, machinery uh, machines were developed, uh, maintenance existed. Yet we do maintenance today the same way uh, the day the days machines were de- developed the first time. We still do maintenance uh, uh, when when something breaks, and not when some not to prevent. We don't use data to predict and anticipate enough. Uh, and uh, so that, that there is in, 
there is not enough progress there. And, uh, and I believe that's one very small, but very important, significant step that if we all do, we get into a different level. So the solution could be that we assess and develop roadmaps of, of technology implementation on a per operation basis or enterprise basis that, 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 that really in, in which you make choices to, to, to sequence the interventions in a way that, that, that help today's delivery and tomorrow's preparation. But the problem is that we, it, so far, we don't, we don't do that. What we do is to test technologies on a horizontal way. Uh, even in our, in our, in our lighthouses, which are amazing, we, we, we test technologies, you know, a, a group of technologies in a given operation, and we see the results that are amazing. But we, we, that, that lighthouse demonstrates the power of it, but it doesn't demonstrate the power of sequencing. And how do you sequence it in a way that really delivers today and prepares for tomorrow? That's the solution that I think we should come up with, which is the strategy, the strategy, a strategy definition for a roadmap implementation of new technologies that assure that you can cover today's needs and tomorrow's uh, challenges. Can I and there are solutions to that, by the way. There are already solutions to do that. Can I add just a few words? Uh, there is one thing that uh, we are doing more and more, the digital twins. Because that, that creates uh, an alternative to, to look into what is happening uh, in a physical way. With the digital twin, you can find, uh, you know, if there is a, a bulb that you have to change from behind the machine, it's there. You know exactly uh, in the digital twin what you have to change. But basically, what we see now is that the, the way uh, fabrication is one thing, uh, industry and so on. But the other one is meeting people. Uh, uh, as uh, you were talking uh, before, uh, meeting people nowadays, uh, before it was always physical. I would go to Singapore for a, for a meeting, you know, business meeting with, uh, um, you know, several companies and so on, or in, uh, in London or in uh, Bahrain or something. Nowadays, we are not doing that. And what I think, because of uh, pandemic difficulty, maybe with, with the passport, you know, the, the vaccination passport, but in fact, we are going to be used to the new normal, which means we don't have to go, you know, a thousand people to like what us is to Lisbon or, or whatever it is or to Singapore because we can do this. And this is very effective. You know, first of all, we don't waste time uh, commuting. OK, it's fun you know, it's good to, to meet people, shake hands and so on. But in fact, what we gain uh, from meeting people is only 10% more than talking about the, the, the things, except for the personal relationship, shaking hands, you know, kissing ladies and so on. You know, all this uh, is, is a different uh, thing, but, but it's fantastic that we can do this. You know, for one year, all the meetings I have is online and it's fantastic. It's, it's good. In fact, I get more people to join than if it's physical. It's, uh, you yeah, know, I can really Sorry, interrupting you. We have uh, like uh, three minutes before we okay. end. I want everyone to say like a uh, very quick ending of uh, maybe some predictions, some feelings, and some ideas. Uh, well, uh, Viren, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. I mean, just listening to all my colleagues, and I do agree with everything said. And I think all of us, if we all work as leaders to try and ensure implementation of I4 digitalization across the companies that we work in and more through industry associations. I'm at this moment talking to several hundred industrial companies in India and in the US to try and see how do we use examples like Lighthouse and more to implement that in the, co in the companies that we're working on in different plants. And if we can up this whole activity and publicize it. And I come to you and say, hey, I'm doing it in 20. And you talk about it, that you're doing another 100. And we keep all bubbling up this, this whole level of activity. I think we'll start talking about practically what has never been talked about, the implementation of Industry 4.0 than just the concept of it. And if we can make that happen, again, I make this point that I believe economically, globally, it will add to economic prosperity and growth and improve people's skillings because we will reskill them, but they will become, they'll be more prepared for the new new future. Okay. That's my take on, on, on execution. Three minutes. 
Gustavo. I, I, I love every word. I'm there. That's, I, 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 I had the same message. That, uh, a call to action is what it comes to. Okay. Um, Michelle? Yeah, so, I mean, people, we don't change our behavior because we see the light. We change our behavior because we feel the heat. And I think that doing a bit of what Joe said, COVID-19 has sort of artificially created a visceral understanding of there are consequences when we get stuck in just these short-term reward systems. And I think we need to fundamentally, we, we need to somehow bake in a lot of longer-term strategic uh, thinking in before amnesia bias kicks in again and we forget all the lessons from COVID. So we have a short, small number of years, really, to bake in some great practices to make the world, a, you know, a better place. Okay, Joanna. Yeah, I mean, just leaving with, you know, I think that 80% of, you know, just a reminder that 80% of technologies fail because we aren't preparing our people on how to use them. So we need to upskill people. We need to, as organizations, understand that just deploying technology is not going to solve the problem that we have to, it's, I, I, I love what Biren said, it's a combination of successful implementation with you know, making sure that people are ready to, or people have the skills to be able to, to implement them. And then also, you know, just as, as, as Michelle just said, and, and Gustavo, that we, that we have the reward structure set up to do that for the long-term and the long-term gain of, of the world. Elidio? Well, just a conclusion. I think that in many ways, COVID-19 brought a lot of opportunities to rethink our, our way of, uh, of doing things and uh, you know I think it, in many ways I looked into the positive side you know in uh, my offices my my correspondence with with a